Hi, today I'm going to read for you an excerpt from my book, Autism Translated. At 18 months, I took no notice of my mother's absence at the park when she hid behind a tree. My mother chalked this up to an independent free spirit, but couldn't quite say the same about my painting obsession with black spots, which had her wondering if she had unwittingly done something to psychologically damage me. To her immense relief, I did eventually outgrow the black spots and traded them in for rainbows, flowers, and butterflies. Two years after the black spot painting spree began, but I was still inconsolable and came unglued over seemingly insignificant events like the car moving before my seatbelt was completely fastened and the sensation from tags and scenes which made getting dressed a painful morning ritual for everyone involved. Ironically, I went barefoot whenever I had the chance, even in the snow. I was the kid who snuck into an empty classroom to play hooky from recess, completely mystified, even frightened by children my own age, who engaged in what I perceived as unpredictable and illogical behaviors. I spent a lot of time spinning around in circles and watching people's mouths when they talked to me so I could avoid looking into their eyes. I spoke like a little adult with expansive vocabulary and complex sentence structure that amused my parents and confused my peers. When I was eight, the other girls got together and told me I was stuck up because of the way I talked. Their comment punctuated the awkwardness that I felt but had not yet risen to my conscious recognition. From that point on, I made it a deliberate effort to censor every word and do my best to talk like the other kids. At age 13, the other teens in my neighborhood were having sprinkler parties. I was reading Shakespeare, Chaucer, and the dictionary. But not just any dictionary, it had to be the English Oxford Dictionary. I was relieved to have those books as an excuse to turn down invitations to these puzzling social gatherings where kids would deliberately spray each other with water. And while I avoided the unpredictability of a water fight behind closed doors, I would stare at the faucet, mesmerized by the liquid flowing between my fingers. I studied every ethnic costume known to the Western world in detail and could correctly identify their origin in a lineup. I had absolutely no idea why other girls my age wanted autographs from Michael Jackson or Prince. It was not logical to want the signature of someone you didn't even know. At school, I missed more days than I attended. The doctor could find no reason for my chronic sickness. And because I made good grades, followed the rules, and got along well with adults, no one except my mother worried much or noticed that anything was amiss. To this day, I get overwhelmed when ordering from the menu at Starbucks or making a purchase with cash, refuse to enter Walmart during Christmas season, read every single word on the cereal box, follow elaborate rituals in public restrooms, require several days of isolation to recover from a rare appearance at a party, and forget to ask for help when I am lost on the road. If I'm completely honest, I still occasionally get sidetracked watching water pour from the faucet. While I have managed to fly mostly under the radar with my quirky behaviors, my daughter Diana flew straight into it. She had punched enough holes in walls, melted down enough in the grocery store, and struggled enough in school to draw the attention of psychologists by the time she was six. At 11, she received an autism spectrum diagnosis and underwent speech therapy for central auditory processing. Close colleagues and friends tease me about my quirky habits and call me an undiagnosed Aspie. They say Diana didn't get all her qualities from her dad and that my career choice and lifelong attraction to people on the spectrum is a result of an underlying familiarity and shared common experience. Perhaps they are right. What I do know for certain is this. My own sensitivities, ritualistic behavior and difficulties with relationships cause me to question the methods of autism treatment and the attitudes towards people on the spectrum that were prevalent in the field when I started years ago. I ignored much of what I was taught. Instead, I made it a point to listen to as many autistic people as I possibly could. I wanted to understand their points of view. I wanted to know what worked for them. I found their observations and advice to be very accurate and effective in getting positive outcomes. And through the years, common themes began to appear in spite of many different personalities and life experiences that each of these individuals had. The core message that ultimately emerged in each of these cases is simple yet profound. Forging a healthy understanding and connection is critical to ensure autistic people can live happy, well-adjusted lives. On the flip side, ignorance, prejudice, and refusal to understand the autism spectrum can and often do result in serious consequences. I have worked with individuals who were falsely convicted of crimes they did not commit, unknowingly caught in bankruptcy, traumatically committed to psychiatric hospitals, chemically restrained, homeless, estranged from families, fired from jobs, kicked out of school, 
financially or sexually exploited, and addicted to alcohol or other drugs, often opiates. In most of these instances, these problems could have been avoided simply with the right knowledge, understanding, and a little support. These are the worst case scenarios, but even in the best of circumstances, when people have tremendous resources and fulfilling lives, this does not diminish the hard work and unending determination to overcome adversity that has contributed to their successes. This book was written specifically about the unique circumstances faced by teens and adults whose concerns and challenges may slip through the cracks or go unrecognized and unsupported because autism does not always show up in the ways that people expect. It is not always obvious. As children grow up, they develop coping skills, gain understanding, and learn new ways to function. As a result, autism becomes less noticeable, but it is still there. Many of the children I've worked with started out with classic signs of autism, being nonverbal, spinning in circles, no eye contact, thought facial expressions, and grew up to develop wonderful language and skills to relate with others, but may still struggle or need support in some capacity. This book is certainly applicable to them as much as it is to the Aspie adult who never got a diagnosis and holds things together without any outside All right, help. Now I'd like to read an excerpt for you from chapter 3, which talks about sensory issues. Learning under stress. It's a fact. No one learns well or communicates effectively in a state of fight or flight. And that is exactly the position we are in when our sensory system is operating at a heightened state. This heightened awareness of sight, smells, touch, taste, and or sound increases our level of anxiety because our senses feel constantly under attack. Teachers, parents, and therapists are busy trying to get us to learn social and communication skills while we are in an anxious and defensive state of mind. But don't take our word for it. Research has shown that when a person learns under conditions of stress, the memory is impaired, and the learner may become rigid in their ability to apply this knowledge in their lives, favoring habit over a more flexible, thought-based, or cognitive type of memory. For those of us who are autistic, this rigid type of learning tends to be especially pronounced, so it is very important to create a safe environment for skill development so that we can establish the right pathways to our brain for flexible and adaptive learning. Here's the good news. Oftentimes, when our sensory challenges are addressed, the communication and socialization problems that are important to you become easier to address and sometimes even cease to be problems at all. I'm going to skip over to the place where I talk about um, the empathy myth. Acute empathy. The official definition of autism describes a lack of empathy or a lack of ability to put ourselves in someone else's shoes or feel what they're feeling as a social deficit. And most people would probably agree with this description because it has to do with the ability to relate socially to other people. However, many people with hypersensitivity consider empathy to be at least in part a sensory characteristic. Contrary to popular opinion, many autistic people do have empathy for others. While well, having and or showing a lack of empathy is one of the possible characteristics of autism, it is feasible to meet the official criteria for autism and have empathy too. As a matter of fact, some of us actually feel empathy so deeply that when an animal or a person suffers, we may experience sensations of physical pain in our bodies. Myth. Autistic people cannot experience empathy or caring for others. Fact. Some of us lack empathy, some of us experience empathy but don't know how to express it, and some of us feel intense empathy. Our feelings of empathy may evolve as we become older and mature. Having empathy and showing empathy are two different aspects of identifying with how other people feel. In other words, a person can lack the words to communicate that they relate to another person's experience. And finally, I want to read one more excerpt from the chapter on developing a relationship called Accept Then Expect. Often parents or caregivers think, first I will get my child to communicate and behave normally, then I will be able to connect with them. And while there is a lot of pressure on caregivers from society for parents to get their children to behave normally, this approach is backwards. Just as we need to address our sensory and anxiety issues before we work on communication and social skills, we need to forge an authentic connection with you before we begin to learn how to socialize according to the expected norms of society. Allowing us to recognize and follow our own intuition, and then allowing for the honest exchange of connection comes first. Adaptation to social rules comes naturally as a result of healthy connection. Myth. If I teach my child communication and social skills first, they will then be able to better connect with me. 
fact, create a healthy connection and social skills will naturally follow. All right, this is an excerpt from chapter two, which is titled Problem Alchemy, Turn Troubles into Strengths. And it is a case study um, of a gentleman named Vince. Autism and self-identity. While therapists, doctors, and parents of young children often refer to autism as a disease, disability, or tragedy, an overwhelming majority of adults on the spectrum have a very different idea. Case study Vince. If someone decided that because descendants from Africa have a greater genetic disposition towards sickle cell anemia, that we should cure being black, they would be considered prejudiced and illogical. Rightly so, we choose to treat the sickle cell instead. Likewise, just because an autistic person has a greater probability of dealing with gastrointestinal problems, for example, does not mean that getting rid of autism is the solution. This idea ranks up there with lobotomizing patients in the 40s. I have no interest in being cured or fixed, and I find it ironic that those of us on the spectrum are accused of rigid thinking when so many neurotypical notions of autism can only be described as just that, rigid. For example, I find it rigid thinking to assume the autistic brain is a mistake of nature.